the idea of these sessions is to try and connect researchers and practitioners from different disciplines and backgrounds and so we've got a very interdisciplinary audience here and also you're all at different career stages and so we want to use these sessions to try and create links between you listen to new ideas and just create some sort of discussion um, this term we have an underlying theme of what causes disasters and today the speakers are going to focus on why how we talk about disasters matters so this includes the implications that language can have for understanding causality and impact. For example, why, have there, why has there been a move away from the term natural disasters and thinking about uh, disasters of one-off events? And then more specifically, uh, looking at one event, who decides when a flood becomes a flood? So we have three speakers today. Uh, so thank you very much for joining and giving up your time. These are um, Dr. Ksenia Chimatina, from Loughborough University, uh, Peter McGowan from King's College London, and Dr. Stephen Forrest from the University of Hull. So I've told each speaker to be about 10 to 15 minutes, and I've also apologised in advance if I interrupt them at the 15 minute mark, uh, because we do want to leave some time for questions at the end. So we'll probably go just over the hour. Um, the presentations are going to be recorded, but we'll stop that when it comes to the discussion section. Um, do feel free to write your questions in the chat though as we go along, because if you're a little bit like me, you might forget them, um, and then we'll get to them at the end. So we'll get on with the talk straight away. So our first speaker is going to be Dr. Kassen. Dr. Ksenia Chimutina, from, uh, who is a reader in Sustainable and Resilient Urbanism at Loughborough University. And she's going to be building upon some of the topics which we touched upon in last week's seminar um, and why we should move away from the term natural disasters. So we'll go straight over to you. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thanks everyone for joining. It's really nice, nice to be here. And talk about my favorite topic, no natural disasters. Um, so in the next, 10 minutes, I will um, kind of unpack um, the expression natural disasters and also the negative implications of using this expression. Um, I guess many of you are aware of the No Natural Disasters campaign on social media, um, which is so masterfully orchestrated by Kevin Blanchard. And if you're not, please follow us on at No Nat Disasters on Twitter and use hashtag No Natural Disasters. And so very often we get asked, kind of as a part of this campaign and more broadly, why do we care about removing natural from the narrative about disasters? You know, isn't it just the semantics? And even before the campaign, which sort of started in 2018, um, you know, my comrades and co-conspirator Jason von Madden and I um, had kind of similar reactions from various people uh, when we talked about it and did a bit of corridor activism in 2017 global platform uh, for disaster risk reduction in Cancun. Um, and that was perhaps the reason why we also started Disasters Deconstructed podcast, which kind of where we really want to unpack what is a disaster. Um, because we really wanted to explain why natural disasters misnomer isn't just about the semantics. Um, there is much more to it. And, thus, and that, that more includes power and politics as well as oppression and exploitation. And, you know, we are not the first people to talk about it, that I just want to kind of make it absolutely clear. I'm sure you're all aware of the letter written by Rousseau to Voltaire in 1756, reflecting on the um, 1755 Lisbon earthquake. Um, and of course, of all the work that has been done since the 1970s, you know, starting from the seminal paper by uh, Phil O'Keefe, late Phil O'Keefe and the colleagues on taking natural out of natural disasters. And I can spend next 10 minutes just listing the names of people, you know, who have contributed significantly to moving the argument forward that disaster is not natural. Um, and also of people who are shifting uh, really the disaster agenda from kind of hazard to vulnerability. And so the argument is, is pretty clear. A hazard does not need to turn into a disaster. But what uh, was missing or has been missing in these conversations is often this focus on kind of implications of, of the, using the misnomer. Um, and so Jason von Medin and I were once sitting at some conference. I think it was actually in Lisbon, which, you know, quite serendipitous, really. Um, and we thought, you know, why don't we actually try and look at how natural disasters um, I've used it always in quotation mark. Um, I used in academic literature and also in policy reports. 
And so we started doing some extensive systemic searches and soon realized that we really need to set some kind of boundaries, otherwise we will just drown. And you know, by drown, I mean kind of hundreds of thousands of results uh, on Google with the mention of natural disaster. And so in the end, we um, ended up looking at um, almost 600 academic papers from six key journals. Um, and our time frame was uh, between 1976 and 2018, 1976 being when O'Keefe et al. paper was released. So we looked at Disaster Prevention Management Journal, Natural Hazards, Disasters, International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction, International Journal of Disaster Risk Science, and International Journal of Disaster Resilience in the Built Environment. And we then uh, looked at Prevention Web and also um, analyzed 400 and 11 um, international governmental and non-governmental policy plans and statements or kind of publications and all of this we've done the full text searches for natural disaster and we only selected um, papers that actually used vulnerability lens you know that talked about kind of social construct um, and what we found out is that actually between 1976 and 2018 the use of misnomer has increased despite all the scholarship and all the effort that try to, you know, to, to, to uh, show otherwise. So we realized that there are three major trends um, in, in, uh, in which natural disasters are used in academic and policy writing. So first of all, what we called kind of nature versus people. Um, and the, the authors uh, of these pieces clearly um, see the difference between natural and human induced hazards. And this debate has become kind of particularly prominent in recent years because many argue that the use of expression natural disaster um, works and the language should, should thus not be changed because it separates from technological disasters, say nuclear meltdown, you know, building collapse, conflict and war. So if we don't say natural disaster, it is not clear what kind of disaster we're talking about. And it is not clear that it is ha hazard induced. Um, and so a significant amount of disaster research in, in this particular category comes from geological science that focus on earthquakes, you know, volcano eruptions, landslides, and so on. Um, and perhaps that explains the, the use of um, the language. But this kind of focus does not encourage to consider broader social, economic, and political aspects of disaster risk reduction. Um, the second category or the second trend was usage of natural disaster as a buzzword. In other, in other words, kind of convenience of a clarity. And so the majority of articles here were um, found to be using the expression, the misnomer, without seeming to consider the implications. And often the expression was used alongside phrases like social vulnerability, you know, producing really odd mix of language. Um, and this is particularly problematic as the expression is being used for convenience rather than for intellectual clarity. Um, and it is often argued, you know, we had loads of debates on social media, I'm sure, you know, some of you were kind of party to that, that the phrase is used because it is understood by general audience. Um, but with scientists having an increasing responsibility to communicate their research to lay audience, this argument is most commonly kind of advanced and uh, we feel that we actually as scientists have responsibility um, to communicate much clearer and to think about the implications and finally so the third category of the papers that we looked at and this is our favorite category is the one in which the authors presented the critique so the authors pointed out that considering vulnerability economic development culture perception politics you know you you name it uh, all clarifies the connection between natural hazards and disastrous outcomes and some of these authors um, in this category discuss the interdependencies between uh, demographic and demographic for example and disaster impacts um, others argued for uh, reconsideration of the ways we understand and therefore implement disaster management you know so it's all about kind of theory and terminology around it but the overall message of this category was the same that the root causes of vulnerability, i.e. power-driven processes, turn hazards into disasters. And so these were kind of much more critical reflections on the misnomer. And so the overall count context of the sample, which is, you know, over a thousand papers, is one that shows consciousness towards the fact that disasters are socially constructed. Um, the question is therefore this, does the expression natural disaster undermines the effort of a vulnerability-centered narrative? And so what are the implications of using the natural disasters misnomer? Well, the downside of using the expression is multifaceted. Uh, it removes responsibility from those um, 
often at fault and kind of lessen the likelihood of mean, meaning, meaningful discourse and power, class inequality, marginalization, oppression uh, that should accompany any attempt to understand disaster risks. Um, it can also serve up a narrative that prioritizes the story of hazard and destruction over any consideration um, of processes of development or maldevelopment in, in our case. Um, the expression also regularly serves the interests of the powerful as a symbolic tool. It signifies that whilst we might like to prevent disasters, disaster losses and impacts, uh, we are at the mercy of nature, right? It kind of externalizes the threat beyond the human dimension. And it also allows celebration of man's dominion over nature and maintains the power structure that might otherwise be threatened by um, any examination of the way that the dominant socioeconomic system creates risk. And the expression natural disaster is often employed by those advocating technocratic and market-based solutions. And it is unfortunately reinforced by policymakers as well as um, popular media. And this fits well, of course, with kind of neoliberal free market driven disaster industry, because seeing disasters as natural means that the nature is dangerous, but can nevertheless be managed. Or when it cannot be managed, the blame can be put on nature. And such position reinforces the status quo, avoiding responsibility for failures of development by blaming nature. But as we were kind of developing this work, few people argued saying that this is just a term of convenience, right? So but we we didn't think so and so we decided to, to kind of to prove it so we started working with um linguists and psychologists and we've been collaborating with them in 2018 and so jason and i teamed up with colin tucker smith and victoria collins uh, from university of florida um, and we carried out project implicit so what we wanted to know is does the expression natural disasters um shows us uh, kind of the, the political and ideological um, stance of the people who blame disasters on nature. And so we've, we, 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 this work is ongoing, but the correlation is there. So we measured political orientation, orientational social issues, belief about disasters, and preferred way to deal with the risk. And there were 507 participants uh, from 40 different countries. And so we found that understanding of blame origins of risks and preferred um, mitigation solutions strongly correlate with political ideology, that implicit attitudes towards the underlying cause of disaster were also defined by ideological differences, and that understanding disasters as natural actually correlates with technocratic solutions. And this work is ongoing and uh, hopefully it will be published soon and you know we have we have to share more soon but then of course we mustn't also forget that um, whilst the implications of putting responsibility of nature is kind of universal the actual translation of this argument doesn't always work in other languages so we team teamed up with Neil Sadler who is a linguist and collected the translation of the term disaster uh, in 53 different languages uh, it was kind of part of a bigger exercise we wanted to look at various terms we use in, in disaster risk reduction and disaster was one and what we found out is that many language, in many languages, disaster isn't the concept in itself. And very often it's the same word um, kind of as a risk or a hazard. And so in other languages, the phrase natural disaster is actually kind of inseparable, right? So we need to remember that, of, that, that often it's not the word itself, but the meaning is what matters because different encoded meanings emerge from ideological perspective and, and demonstrate political agendas. Um, and it has never it has never been our intention or the intention of no natural disasters campaign to police the use of language. Instead, we hope that understanding of the implications will change the way we frame our narrative about disasters. And so current narrative about disasters that you know that they are unexpected and natural um, creates an illusion that seems real. Um, the effect referred to Yurchak as hypernormalization, where it is the story and not the reality that matters. So the story narrated through natural disasters help people, um, helps the story of neoliberal uh, resilience building, i.e. the story of kind of successful recovery, of going back to normal and you know, living happily ever after. Uh, but such ending seem to only exist in fairy tales. And in reality, resilience building and its best body build it back better, um, simply reconstructing the risks and recreating and sometimes enhancing inequalities um, that eventually lead to yet another disaster. And so in, in a disaster, people can lose livelihoods, um, shelter, family, sense of dignity, and you know, physical infrastructure that makes their daily life possible. But as we know, disasters do not affect everyone equally. Um, so those who are most marginalized in day-to-day -day existence are those who are the most harmed by disasters. 
for the marginalized, um, disaster is never a new, sudden, or unexpected danger. It is a continuation of everyday harm inflicted on those um, relegated to the margins of society. Disasters do not simply bring about suffering, they expose suffering. And so for those who have no voice in decision-making, no claim to an official place to live, a livelihood tied to meager natural resources or a degraded environment, trauma, suffering, and displacement are not unique to disaster. And yet calling disasters natural allows for capitalist exploitation to thrive and increase the suffering and then blame it on nature. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. So much information. <laughs> so I'm sure we can like draw some of that out more in the discussion section later. But that leads on really nicely to Peter McGarren's talk, particularly. So I came across Peter's work quite recently as well at a previous event where he was talking about we shouldn't view a disaster as a one off event. And that really builds on some of the stuff that you've just said. So, yeah, Peter is a PhD student at King's College in London, and I will pass straight over to you, Peter. So thank you again. Thanks, Anna, and thanks, Ksenia. I really enjoyed that. Um, I've got some slides, so I'm just going to share those. Um, this is always the challenge because the buttons at the top cover up the slideshow button. <laughs> so I can't. Uh, it's F5, right? I think. Should be F5, yeah. Um, there we go. Okay. Yes, yeah, so. Uh, Thanks, uh, Hannah, Rory, and everyone for inviting me to this discussion. Really interested and looking forward to the Q&A and discussion later. Um, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, so this question, I guess, kind of uh, invites some kind of theoretical responses, which is what I hope to provide. But I'll also um, link those to my PhD research, which looks at landslides in a place called Kalimpong. It's like a, a district in the state of West Bengal in uh, in India, in the Himalayan foothills. Um, and I completed my field work there 2019, 2020, just before the pandemic, luckily. Um, so first I'll um, introduce and discuss some things like theoretical things relating to a paper that I um, recently published with uh, my supervisor, Amy Donovan, who I'm sure many of you will know, who's at Cambridge. Um, so I'll lay out some key ideas there discuss the analytical implications of that and then sort of talk about how I use those ideas in my analysis and field work and then kind of summarize. Um, so yeah, this is really helpful to build on Ksenia's talk uh, and her references to the kind of uh, really older work on disasters and the move away from uh, understanding disasters as natural. I actually went back to some of the literature and I found this, this edited volume by Quarantelli, which actually has the title, what is a disaster? So that was like, just shows that these debates have been going on for such a long time. Uh, and it's kind of led to a, a, a situation where we're at now, where I think particularly, at least in the scholarly community, we have this kind of base assumption that disasters aren't natural um, and they're very much connected to political and economic processes. Um, but I guess in the paper, Amy and I kind of start from a problematization of some existing interpretations where we find that even with like social and critical interpretations, of disasters that the, the uncertainty and the physical characteristics of disasters tend to sometimes be overlooked and seen as insignificant. Um, but on the other side, speaking to the issues that Ksenia raised in terms of even those approaches which look at the social side of things, but maybe look at those through an ecological lens or like a kind of too overly quantified lens may miss out on some of the um, drivers, political drivers of established theory. So of disasters, sorry. So in that way, we use assemblage theory to try and soften the distinctions between hazards and vulnerabilities and approaching them as discrete categories, but understanding them more as relational uh, and connected to um, what we call features in the making, which is kind of views of how we should develop and how the world should be. And according to those imaginations we develop, but also contribute to disaster risk. So, um, in that paper, we build on Amy's previous paper and say that analysis of disasters can consider these six themes, which is kind of what I use to analyze the data that I collected in my research. Um, and we propose that this is like a disaster risk management assemblage approach, which looks at, like that's the name of the approach, but also looks at disaster risk management assemblages, which are those kind of powers and structures in place um, that 
are supposedly supposed to respond to mitigate and prevent disasters occurring, but as it's been shown through decades of research, actually contribute to um, those risks. So we get this kind of paradoxical situation where we have people in power contributing to the emergency disasters whilst also responding to them. Another idea within, within that approach is this one of disasters in the making, which we set out in the paper, which is, has its roots kind of in geographical theory and uh, geographical philosophy, I guess, Thalusian philosophy. Um, and this idea is supposed to speak to the idea of disasters as risks, as possible features of a given assemblage, as something that is inherently connected into the decisions and the processes by which decisions are made over um, how we live with the environment and our relationship with nature um, so that they become less seen as external shocks but something that's very much embedded in the way that we continue to carry on living or the way in which power is differentiated in society but then it also helps I hope to the idea is that it allows the researcher to look at how does possible disasters materialize and then also how they are reimagined reconfigured uh, and reassembled for different actors according to different political views. Um, so you kind of get the process and the temporal nature of understanding of disasters as something that exists as a possible future, materializes in visceral uncertain ways with differentiated impacts, uh, but then also um, is reconfigured and imagined uh, as it continues to unfold. Kind of trying to understand um, and in an analytical way, um, this kind of trains a focus initially towards the kind of non-human, more than human physical aspects of disasters or the hazards and understanding how their behavior and their impacts are or are not shaped and influenced by the way in which we develop, basically, in simpler terms. Um, and this involves basically considering the geography of disasters. So to answer the question of like, what is a disaster, I suppose, is will always be and the way at which it is defined according to either if it's an event or a process or a social or natural event the extent to which it displays those characteristics will be determined by its geography essentially and that is dependent on its political economic cultural linguistic and material contexts and those contexts are always subject to change uh, but also kind of show to like, like switch the idea of resilience so we get these resilient structures resilient processes which continue to put people at risk and which are dependent on kind of historical uh, processes. <clears throat> so, and this also helps to think about how uh, the researchers position in relation to the disasters that they are researching, um, reflecting on how through our kind of academic understandings of disasters, how we might be reassembling or reconfiguring how actually they uh, understood and experienced disasters and took an experience at a local or different level. Um, so it, it's really about asking what disasters are in the particular place and what are the specific drivers of that. Uh, and yeah, so this underpinned my uh, PhD research, um, which kind of changed as I went into the field and actually kind of was thinking along these lines and was thinking about essentially how I ended up needing to speak to the people who are affected by disasters more than the people who were maybe designed or uh, given the responsibility of like disaster management or like people in positions of power, I felt I actually needed to speak to the people who were affected. But also given my positionality and linguistic barriers, I um, ended up deciding to try and work with a research assistant who I was luckily just in a sort of to befriend in a chance encounter who ended up working with me. And we reflect on the process of the methodology in this paper that's going to be part of a special issue in disaster prevention and management um, coming out soon, hopefully, on these kinds of issues of framing. Um, so we, we visited about 50 landslides and spoke to nearly 100 people, I suppose, speaking to different people at different places um, to understand what disasters are um, in those locations and how they could be understood using this uh, approach where we didn't go in looking for the natural hazards or the social vulnerabilities, but understanding and listening to people's narratives of how the disaster occurred and then trying to um, amplify that. Uh, so this is one example that we visited, which is a, a landslide that occurred in 2015 alongside many others, because there was a heavy rainfall event that June. Um, and 
I'm going to basically try and sort of narrate this through this idea of disasters in the making. Um, so multiple processes contributed to the emergence of this landslide. However, it appears that this bypass being built uh, to fulfill economic and geopolitical ambitions of the state and central government was what first made the landslide possible. At the time the landslide occurred, this road was being built to bypass the busy Kalimpong town. And beyond that, there is military bases and then the border with China, not so far away. Um, and so basically the people said that they'd been living there for like 50 years and this land, there'd never been any risk of a landslide, but during when this road was being constructed, um, the rain happened, a smaller landslide occurred further up the slope, which diverted the water onto this road. And then there was inadequate drainage there and it kind of accumulated in this one area uh, and caused a landslide, which ultimately killed like a household basically. Um, so these geopolitical assemblages, as we term them, made this landslide a disaster in the making before the heavy rainfall event and resultant formal landslide. Uh, the smaller landslide uh, further up the slope occurred. So that's how the disaster was made possible and was a disaster in the making, but also shows that if we'd gone in and look at, looked at this as a natural hazard, we might have missed out on the fact that actually um, it wasn't necessarily natural, but it was related to social political processes but also very much connected to the uncertainty and the characteristics of the physical environment. <clears throat> and then the narrative continues where um, at the time, this is in a kind of an area where there has been quite a lot of political conflict, conflict over a separatist uh, movement for a separate state of Gorkaland. Um, the residents felt that no action was taken to ensure those responsible made effective repairs or take responsibility for the damage done because they felt at that moment, um, the administration that was in charge of rehabilitation was kind of put in place by the state government as a kind of management solution for this ongoing conflict. And therefore upsetting that political balance wouldn't work in their favor. So partly a result of that lack of action, another landslide and other landslides have occurred in this area since then, um, essentially indicating that this is the disaster still in the making and it's not finished, but it's ongoing and it's being reconfigured by, for and through different groups and that is having leading to the differentiated impacts on the people who uh, are the relatives of the people who lost their lives, but also people who have just lost their lands uh, and their farming land to these landslides. And this is substantiated by this uh, local NGO who I worked with quite a lot, who kind of links this um, to what I, me and my research system came to call the landslide economy, whereby um, so these. Uh, sorry, what's one sec? Basically, uh, the landslides cause, uh, roads cause landslides and they need to be repaired with more concrete and more concrete walls and repairing of the road, uh, which is actually in this kind of economically marginalized region, um, a lucrative kind of economy essentially where money and materials are provided by the government to contractors who to repair roads. But the problem is the landslides they're built in such a way that landslides continue to occur. So then there's more repairs needed and therefore the cycle kind of continues and the disaster remains in the making. Um, so it's kind of trying to, but also showing that this is very much a uh, sort of material process as much as it is um, connected to geopolitics and economics. So yeah, hopefully this term is useful to capture the complex temporalities of disasters such as landslides, but hopefully other um, disasters too. Um, it looks at the materialization of disaster risks as continuing events to use a phrase uh, used by Cloak et al in relation to the Christchurch earthquake. And they talk about disasters as continuing events or something that can be imagined as a, an event. And even through that process of imagining something as a one-off event that has political consequences. Um, and yeah, it still kind of tries to make sense of the social vulnerability aspects, but it's also not leaning too much on a kind of determinist account of why those disasters might occur and looking for understandings of disasters that are rooted in the places where they happen. Um, and I hope this kind of links to some of the other participants work in this way. I was reading Rory's paper, which we talks about disasters being made as much as being experienced, social as well as material, uh, and obviously rooted in historical processes and I guess kind of fitting into a wider theoretical narrative that's trying to build up like 
helical nonlinear interpretations of disaster causation was without losing sight of the political drivers of risk. Um, but yeah, I've got plenty more to talk about. So hopefully if you have any more questions about my research or anything, then I can bring that up in the Q&A. Um, that's me, thanks. Perfect, thank you so much. And as you said, we'll definitely follow some stuff up in the Q&A. Um, that was really good. Um, so yeah, our next speaker is Stephen Forrest, Dr. Stephen Forrest, who is a lecturer in flood resilience and sustainable transformations at the University of Hull. So I'll pass straight over to you now, Stephen, um, and he will talk about how we define flooding. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Very happy to be here to just just uh, to share some of my thoughts, provide some food for thought. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I see yeah, a thumbs up. Can, yeah. Brilliant. So, um, as Hannah introduced uh, myself, I'm a lecturer in flood resilience and sustainable transformations. I used to be a lecturer in flood resilience, but then a lot of people thought I took a very engineering-based approach. And um, as a proud social scientist, I added three extra words at the end to make it also about sustainable transformations. So when I'm thinking about it, I'm going beyond only flood safety. Of course, flood safety is very important for flooding, but I'm looking at more, the, also looking at the longer term transformational thinking and rethinking of how we engage with floods and looking beyond only flood safety to also think about capacities, um, to think about potential transformations, but also going beyond no, sorry, also equal, looking at the ability to be, be flood resilient, if you can ever become flood resilient, truly. Um, in reflecting on this and where my research is going and my teaching, uh, we realize it's really needed, we really need to look at flooding as a term. So how do we understand flooding or how has flooding been understood? Um, how is it changing with its management and how is this management changing in itself, as well as the implications of all of this? So I'm just going to present a few of my thoughts on flooding itself and it ties into the conversations and the presentations of um, the last two speakers who were talking about the natural element and of course the hidden drivers within that so i hope you'll enjoy it and let's start off just by looking at a few uh, devastating flood depictions recorded across history um, we're unsure about the exact nature of the flood events but you can see that floodings and the threat and risk posed by floods has influenced societies far into the past We've got the great floods in China. We've got the idea of fighting against water in the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, a Mesopotamian flood myth from about 700 BC. We also have the great wave of Kanagawa. And this is illustrated here with the wood, woodblock prints, which was made maybe 1829 to 1833 time. If we go into more recent times, you might recognize these images. Um, I, I don't have time to do it as a quiz, but the top one is the day after tomorrow. You see flooding there, running through the streets, water where it's not supposed to normally be. And underneath, that's Lord of the Rings, Arwen's floods taking out the ring wraiths on their horses. Um, there's also ideas when we're thinking about flooding um, associated with human sacrifice. It's so scary and phenomena that we now need to sacrifice the best of us or choose people to sacrifice in order to try and guard against this threatening, this scary, negative consequence. So disasters have been ingrained as being very, or sorry, floods have been ingrained as being very negative. And of course they have negative impacts on lives, livelihoods, and also economic impacts too. They can be very devastating and have significant effects, negative effects. But we also have to be aware of what we mean when we think about floods and the idea of a natural disaster. I won't go into that in too much detail. But I will say that flood risk and flooding is really ingrained within our societies right from their start. If we think about urban settlements, a lot of them have been near to water, trying to maximize the benefits of living in flood risk places. For example, for farming, if we think about um, the River Nile and providing fertile soils in ancient Egypt, civilization itself wouldn't have been able to um, progress in that sense without floods being positive and bringing in fertile or making the soil fertile with their sediments. We also have to think about trading. Trade routes meant that being near a river, being um, near a coast was beneficial. It led to more people going to these areas, a concentration of assets, economic development. It was something positive and it is still positive. 
trade is important. But we have to be aware that these disasters, this flood risk didn't just appear overnight. It's something that is really based from the origins of a lot of cities. This isn't every city, but a lot of cities. And that's where you come into defining a flood. You can think of it as a disaster, something very scary and negative, and it does have a lot of negative impacts. You can also think of it maybe a bit more neutrally as a hydrological description of water coming over its banks. And um, the Oxford English Dictionary also has a definition of a flood as a body of flowing water. So in this sense, not having an attachment with negative impacts or positive impacts, but just as a process. We can also see it as a blessing, something positive, something that people may pray for, might um, do certain cultural traditions to get water to come, because this can be linked to success in their livelihoods, mainly through farming and agricultural success, perhaps. Also, if you're in a drought area, you'd like a lot of rainfall, you'd like this large amount of water to come to you. But if we think of it further than that, we can also think of water as a movement of water, oh, sorry, floods, as a movement of water into an area and then out of an area. So there's a temporality with water. It's also can be described as water that is out of place. You can go further and you can, I've taken this definition from when I, I used to be a biologist in a previous degree. And there, the definition of a weed kind of influences my thinking of a flood in this sense. Too much water at the wrong place at the wrong time. In normal cases, this, this water could be useful, this amount of water is fine, but it's really based on where the water lies and the time at which it lies there. So all these things kind of come together to, want to um, help us understand what we mean by a flood. And it's also something that's culturally produced we look into the Netherlands and we look at Dutch, um, Dutch words, there's two words for floods. There's water overlast and there's overstroming. Water overlast means water nuisance. And this is normally associated with rainfall flood risk. It's not a big disaster, it's a problem, it's a nuisance. Or overstroming, and that's a devastating flood. That's a coastal flood, that's a river flood. And that's based on their experiences with floods and with water over time, which has really affected how they see it. And this, implica this has um, implications for how we manage floods. So I think um, it was mentioned at the beginning about the idea of man versus nature, um, the idea of power and the advocating of technical defenses. Well, we think back, you can see these two examples um, in the US and the Netherlands. It's really stopping the water. It's trying to manage, manage water as a hazard. And also from the Oxford English Dictionary, there's a contrast between la uh, to land. That's how you can understand the flood. And it can be seen as water versus land. And a tension there. But in managing floods, we are seeing shifts. Not everywhere. And it's happening at different paces, depending on the relationship with water. But we're seeing a shift from fighting against water, or hazard control, to living with water, to allowing water in, and the shift to flood resilience. And more than that, it's making space for water and having this floodability or places that can flood. And you can see here, this is from Nijmegen in the Netherlands, where they've affected, I think it's the river, I think it might be the Waal, or the, I think it's the Waal. If not, please, please, if anyone does remember, please do correct me. Um, and then you can see they've built this extra channel here. They've, they've kind of accepted that flooding is a risk. They need to make more space for it. And they also need to make extra temporary spaces for water where extra water can flow into instead of flowing into places where settlements are. And this is it when it's flooded. But then we have to think if the water is there, is it a flood? Is this an example of a flood? It was meant to be there. It was planned. And that has this idea of flood resilience and the shift of flood resilience in that sense I'd go with a more transformative interpretation of trying to, um, it's before, during and after a flood and then continuous changes around the flood, not only on flood risk management, but also societally, culturally, the idea of capacities being developed and getting multiple benefits from flooding or from flood risk management. is also the idea that when you recover from a flood, and there's a question, when do you begin to recover? It's 
looking at the essential maintenance or es maintenance of essential functions or getting essentially the flood waters out and helping people come to terms with this loss and the contamination that still exists within their properties and their streets and maybe affecting their livelihoods. But at the same time, it's having one eye on the future. It's looking for more transform transformational changes. So in that sense, you're really thinking um, of making space for water, but also how can we not reproduce the same pre-flood vulnerabilities that existed? How can we challenge the entrenched inequality and the differences between people and the impacts people had when they were flooded? I've got this image here. This is probably what you think of as a flood. You see a large amount of water, wrong place, wrong time. Some buildings there as well. That's the societal element. Now you'd say, you'd see this and you'd, you'd say, this is definitely a flood. What I'll show you now is a water plaza from the Netherlands. Sorry for the blowiness. This is the water plaza. This is a normal part of a, of a town. Here's the buildings. Got some nice trees. You can see this area here where people can just relax. They can enjoy themselves. This is made to store water. So when there's a large amount of water, maybe a comparable amount, probably a bit less actually, to be honest, uh, to the last image I showed you, is this still a flood? Would you class this as a flood? If you think about it, there's a large amount of water in the wrong place, but maybe it's the right place. Maybe it's the right time as well. So if we're going to making space for water, maybe we need to rethink when is a flood a flood? And what is the right place for water? And how can we, um, how can we deal with that and understand it better? And I'm going to end now just with some food for thought. Um, we're making more floodable places. And this is the idea of flood resilience in a sense, living with water, living with floods. Places that are normally without water are now adapted to hold water. If water is there, is it a flood? But should we really be trying to stop all floods? Maybe some of them are positive, and there are examples where farmers have broken through um, sand-based or soil-based defences to allow the water from the river into their fields because they want their fertility benefits for their soil. That's not always considered. And we also need to think, if we're making space for water, and we go to this idea where more flood will places, more flood resilience in a sense, um, at what cost does this come at and to whom? We're making space for water. This idea of flood resilience also means that we're um, accepting that we cannot prevent every flood. That means we're accepting some floods will happen. Some floods will happen. That's a change from keeping, from focusing on the land water interface and really looking more at our cities when the water meets people, meets societal spaces. One of these features is a greater responsibility for the individual. For example, putting up barriers on their home, property level protection measures, maybe in some case property flood resilience measures where in the home, instead of having carpets, you have concrete, you have things which are easy to wipe away the floods, you raise your sockets, you basically make it so your house could flood and hopefully it would be able to recover the next day if it was going and becoming flood resilient. But who's going to pay for this? Not everyone can afford this, not everyone has the same vulnerability to this. And some people can survive and thrive um, more than others. They might have financial resources. They might have greater social networks and community linkages within their area. So we have to be aware of this. If we're thinking about flooding, first of all, should we be stopping all floods? Are some positive? If there are positives, how can we build this into something more positive in a sense? But who should be paying for this? Who should be picking up either the financial or the emotional cost from this? And is it possible to make floods beneficial for everyone? Could we go into a world um, where water is in the right place at the right time, where water can flow through cities and it doesn't cause damage? And at that point, is it still a flood? Could we have a post-flood era when no floods aren't a disaster at all? So I'll leave you with that food for thought. And uh, well, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that.